Hello, I'm Hans H. Stein, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Illinois. I'm here today to talk to you about a concept called the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus by pigs. This is a relatively new concept that we have developed right here at the University of Illinois. We do believe that if you formulate diets based on the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus, then you'll get a more accurate diet formulation, which will result in reduced feed costs and also in reduced excretions of phosphorus from the pigs. So I'll try to explain some of the details of this new concept. I do want to point out that we first prepared this presentation for the International Phytase Symposium, which was conducted in Washington, D.C. in September 2010. Traditionally, we have evaluated phosphorus in feed ingredients by measuring what we call the relative bioavailability of phosphorus. This concept involves measuring the bioavailability of phosphorus in a standard. In this case, the standard is uh, depicted by a green color. And then there is one or two or several test ingredients involved. A basal diet is formulated and then two or three levels of phosphorus from the standard and from each of the test ingredients is added to the basal diet. That will give a response which can be bone ash or bone breaking strength or bone phosphorus concentration at each level of phosphorus inclusion. After having measured the response to the different levels of phosphorus in the diets, the response criteria is regressed on phosphorus intake for each feed ingredient and regression lines are developed. By dividing the slopes of the regression line for each test ingredient by the slope for the regression line for the standard, the relative bioavailability of phosphorus in each test ingredient is calculated. This procedure has been used for the last 40 years in the U.S. swine industry, and it has worked very well, in particular when different sources of phosphorus are compared. So it's easy to calculate the bioavailability of phosphorus in one source compared to another. However, all values depend on the standard, and because the standard is not the same in all experiments, values from one experiment cannot be compared to values from a different experiment. That creates problems in diet formulations because in diet formulations we use multiple ingredients and the values for relative bioavailability are not additive in mixed diets. There is therefore a need for developing a new concept. Instead of measuring relative bioavailability, the digestibility of phosphorus can also be measured. It is not difficult to measure digestibility of phosphorus in feed ingredients However, there are several questions that need to be answered when digestibility is measured. One of these questions is, should we measure the ileal or the total tract digestibility of phosphorus? What is most accurate? Another question is, what is the effect of the phosphorus level in the diet on phosphorus digestibility? And a third question is, should we use values for apparent or for standardized or for true digestibility to get the most accurate values that can be used in practical feed formulation. I'll talk about all three of these issues, and I'll also give some examples of how to calculate digestibility. We're first talking about the apparent ileal digestibility versus apparent total tract digestibility. Here are some data from a paper that was published in the Journal of Animal Science by Bolke et al. several years ago. And in this case, there were three feed ingredients used a low phytate corn, a normal corn, and soybean meal. Both the apparent total tract digestibility and the apparent ileal digestibility were measured. And it's easy to see here that for all three of these ingredients, there was no difference between values for apparent total tract digestibility and values for apparent ileal digestibility because all the values are very close to each other. This indicates that both values for ileal digestibility and total tract digestibility can be used because they are virtually the same. However, it is easier and less expensive to measure values for total tract digestibility than to measure values for ileal digestibility, and therefore we suggest using values for total tract digestibility. 
Here's the second experiment in which values for duodenal digestibility, ileal digestibility, and total tract digestibility were compared. And in this case, it's easy to see that the duodenal digestibility is very low, about 10% for all three diets that were used here, whereas values for ileal digestibility and values for total tract digestibility are much greater, and they are very close to each other for all three diets. That means that, as we saw before, total tract digestibility give values that are similar to ileal digestibility. In this case, the three diets that were used was a control diet consisting of corn and soybean meal, and then there was that same diet with 500 units of phytase or 1,000 units of phytase. And it is clear from these data that the duodenal digestibility is not affected by the presence of phytase in the diets. However, both the ileal and the total tract digestibility values are much greater when either 500 or 1,000 units of phytase is added to the diet. So from this, it is also concluded that phytase increases the digestibility of phosphorus in a corn-soybean meal diet. However, not all feed ingredients will see an increase in phosphorus digestibility when phytase is used in the diet. And here are some data from an experiment by Almeida and Stein that was published in 2010 in the Journal of Animal Science. And in this case, we used corn, soybean meal, and distillers dried grains with solubles, also called DDGS. And we fed each ingredient either without phytase, which is the red bars, or with phytase, which is the blue bars. For corn and soybean meal, we observed a significant increase in the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus when we added phytase to these ingredients, the same way as we saw in the previous experiment. However, when we used DDGS, there was no increase in phosphorus digestibility when we used phytase. We are not certain why that is, but we have repeated this in other experiments, and we are pretty convinced that there's no effect of phytase when we add it to DDGS. And the reason may be that the digestibility of phosphorus in DDGS is much greater than in corn and soybean meal to begin with, and therefore there's less room for improvement when we add phytase to these diets. The final question we need to answer is, should we use values for apparent total tract digestibility, standardized total tract digestibility, or true total tract digestibility of phosphorus? We can calculate values for apparent total tract digestibility by simply subtracting the output of phosphorus from the intake of phosphorus for a pig fed a given diet. That value will represent the apparent total tract digestibility. If we want to calculate the true total tract digestibility, we have to subtract the total endogenous losses of phosphorus from the output of phosphorus before we subtract from the intake. So this approach requires that we measure not only the intake and the output of phosphorus from the pigs, but also the total phosphorus losses from the pigs. The third option is to measure standardized total tract digestibility values of phosphorus. And in this case, we also have to make a correction for endogenous losses, but we don't measure the total endogenous losses, but only what we call the basal endogenous losses of phosphorus. And we subtract these basal endogenous losses from the phosphorus output from the pigs, and then we subtract that value from the intake of the pigs. From this, it appears that values for true total tract digestibility of phosphorus, as well as values for standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus, are corrected for endogenous losses of phosphorus. But in the case of true total tract digestibility of phosphorus, we correct for the total endogenous losses, whereas for standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus, we only correct for the basal endogenous losses. To talk a little bit more about the endogenous losses, it's important to point out that endogenous losses of phosphorus are losses that occur from a pig no matter which diet it is fed. The total endogenous loss of phosphorus consists of a basal loss and of a specific loss. The basal loss is the loss of phosphorus that a pig will have just from normal cell turnover no matter which diet 
the pig is eating. And the basal losses are not influenced by the type of diet that is fed to the pig. The specific endogenous losses, on the other hand, are influenced by the type of diet and the greater the concentrations of fiber and the greater the concentrations of anti-nutritional factors in the diet is, the greater are the specific endogenous losses. When we add the specific endogenous losses and the basal endogenous losses, we get the total endogenous losses. There's been over the last few years six experiments in which the total endogenous losses have been estimated in growing pigs. The six experiments are listed here and it appears that there's quite a bit of variation in the estimates of total endogenous losses from a low of 8 mg per kilogram dry matter intake and all the way up to 670 mg per kilogram of dry matter intake. The reason for this great variation among different experiments is that the procedure used to estimate total endogenous losses is not very accurate, and that results in big variations among estimates. So the biggest problem we have with total endogenous losses is that we don't have a good procedure that can accurately estimate these total endogenous losses, and that makes it difficult to calculate the true total tract digestibility of phosphorus in diets fed to pigs. The other option we have is to simply measure the basal endogenous losses of phosphorus and then subtract that from the output of phosphorus which will allow us to calculate the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus. Over the last few years, eight different experiments have been conducted to estimate the basal endogenous losses. In all of these experiments, these losses were measured simply by feeding a diet to the pig that contained no phosphorus, and then all the output of phosphorus from the pig was assumed to originate from endogenous sources such as cell turnovers and mucin and microbial phosphorus. The average basal endogenous loss of phosphorus from these eight experiments is 188 mg per kilogram dry matter intake. And it appears from this slide that there's not nearly as much variation in these numbers as there were in the numbers for total endogenous losses. Based on this observation, we suggest that values for standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus are measured because we can relatively accurately estimate the basal endogenous losses of phosphorus and these values are not very variable among different experiments. To illustrate the importance of measuring standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus, we conducted an experiment with three different types of whey powder. We had traditional whey powder and we had a whey permeate called Perlac 850 and we had a another whey permeate called Variolac 960. You see on this slide that the concentration of phosphorus in the, in the whey powder in the Perlac 850 was 0.63 and 0.57% respectively. However, Verilac 960 contained only 0.10% phosphorus. We measured the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus in these three sources, and it appears that Values of 84.3 and 86.1% respectively were obtained for whey powder and for Perlac 850. However, the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus in Variolac 960 was only 55.9%, which was significantly less than in the two other sources. However, when we calculated the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus in these three sources of whey powder, we saw that values of 91.2, 93.1, and 91.8% were obtained for the three sources, and these values were not different. What this tells us is that while values for apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus in Verilac 960 was significantly less than in the other two sources of phosphorus, this was not the case when we converted the values to standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus. And the reason for that is that the endogenous losses from the pigs represent a much greater proportion of the total phosphorus output in Verilac 960 compared with Perlac 850 and whey powder. And the reason for that is that the total concentration of phosphorus in Verilac 960 was much less than the concentration in the other two sources of whey powder. 
So from this, it appears that if we have a feed ingredient with a low concentration of phosphorus, then that feed ingredient will have a calculated value for apparent total tract digestibility that is relatively low because of a greater contribution of endogenous losses in the output from the pig. However, this mistake is eliminated if we calculate values for standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus. And that is one reason why we believe standardized total tract digestibility values are more accurate than apparent total tract digestibility values. Here's another experiment that illustrates the same thing. This is a manuscript that was published in the Journal of Nutrition by Dr. Fan and his colleagues back in 2001. And what Dr. Fan did was he had four different diets with different levels of soybean meal, 13.6, 27.3, 40.8, or 54.6%. In all of these diets, soybean meal provided all the phosphorus. So as the concentration of soybean meal increased in the diet, the phosphorus measured as gram per kilogram dry matter also increased. Dr. Fan then measured the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus in these four diets, and he got values of 18.8, 37.6, 38.5, and 45.2% for the four diets. And these values were significantly different, and they increased as more soybean meal was included in the diet. However, if we convert those values to values for standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus using an assumed value for the basal endogenous losses of 200 mg per kilogram dry matter intake, then we can see we get values of 43.4, 48.4, 44.7, and 48.1%, and all these values are relatively similar. So again, as was the case in the previous experiment, we see here that if we use values for the standardized total tract digestibility, then we eliminate the mistakes that we make when we have values for apparent total tract digestibility calculated in diets with a low concentration of phosphorus. So, in conclusion from this part, we can say that values for the basal endogenous losses are much less variable than values for total endogenous losses of phosphorus. And that makes it possible to calculate values for the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus in different feed ingredients. And these values are believed to be additive in mixed diets, and they are believed to be more accurate than if we use values for apparent total tract digestibility. To illustrate the importance of using standardized total tract digestibility values, we measure the digestibility of phosphorus and the effect of phytase in distillers' dried grains with solubles and other corn co-products. If we look at the concentration of phosphorus in corn, DDGS, high-protein DDG, and corn germ, then we'll see that corn contains only about 0.26% total phosphorus, DDGS contains about 0.60 to 0.70% phosphorus, high-protein DDG contains 0.35% phosphorus, whereas corn germ contains more than 1% phosphorus. If we measure the apparent total tract digestibility of phosphorus in these four ingredients, we quickly note that the digestibility of phosphorus in DDGS and in high-protein DDG is much greater than in corn and in corn germ. The reason for this increased digestibility in DDGS and HPDDG, we believe, is because these two ingredients have gone through fermentation in the ethanol plant and therefore they have less phytate-bound phosphorus compared with corn and corn germ, which have not gone through fermentation. If we add phytase to these ingredients, then we see an increase in the digestibility of phosphorus in corn and in corn germ, and we now get values that are close to 55 to 60 percent for these two ingredients. The digestibility of phosphorus in DDGS and in high-protein DDGS also increases, but not quite as much as for the other ingredients. If we look at the standardized total tract digestibility, we'll see values that are greater than the values for the apparent total tract digestibility, but again, values for DDGS and high-protein DDG are greater than for corn and corn germ. But when we add phytase to these ingredients, then the 
differences among ingredients are less. It is worth noting here that for high protein DDG, we get a standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus that is almost 90%. That means that almost all the phosphorus in this ingredient is absorbed by the pig. Same thing is the case for DDGS, where we have a digestibility of almost 80%. We used these data to conduct a few experiments in which we looked at the effects of phytase and DDGS in diets fed to weaning pigs. This work was conducted by Mr. Ferdinando Almeida, who is a graduate student in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Illinois. In these experiments, we used four different diets. All diets were based on corn and soybean meal, but two of the diets contained no phytase, while the other two diets contained 500 units of microbial phytase. Two diets were formulated based on only corn and soybean meal, while the other two diets, in this case diet 3 and 4, were formulated by adding 20% DDGS to these corn-soybean meal diets. All diets were formulated to contain 0.32% standardized total tract digestible phosphorus. So to get to that level, we had to add 1.15% dicalcium phosphate in the corn-soybean meal diet that contained no phytase. However, when we added phytase to the corn-soybean meal diet, we needed only 0.35% dicalcium phosphorus to get to the 0.32% standardized total tract digestible phosphorus in the diet. When we added DGDS to the corn-soybean meal diet, we needed 0.65% dicalcium phosphate if we had no phytase in the diet. However, if we added phytase along with the DGDS to the corn-soybean meal diet, then we needed no dicalcium phosphate because we already had 0.32% standardized total tract digestible phosphorus in this diet. We then fed all four diets to weaning pigs from about 11 kilograms and until 21 kilograms. We note here that the average daily gain was not influenced by diet composition, although there was a tendency for an increased average daily gain when we added DDGS to the diets. Likewise, for the average daily feed intake, there was no effect of phytase on feed intake, but there was a tendency for an increased average daily feed intake when we added DDGS to the diet. Gain to feed was not influenced by any of the diets, although there was a tendency for a reduction in gain to feed when we added phytase to the corn soybean meal diet, but that was not the case when we added it to the DDGS containing diets. So overall, the final body weight of the pigs was not different among these four diets, but again, there was a tendency for a greater body weight of pigs fed the DGDS-containing diets. We also measured phosphorus retention and phosphorus excretion from the pigs fed these diets. And it appears that phosphorus retention was 2.05 grams per day and 2.07 grams per day when pigs were fed the corn-soybean meal diets without or with phytase, and these values were not different. However, when we fed the diets containing DDGS, retention increased to 2.35 and 2.33 grams per day, respectively, and these values were greater than the values for the corn soybean meal diets. However, we see from these slides that for both types of diets, there's no difference between the diets without phytase and the diet with phytase, which indicates that the digestibility values that we had measured in the ingredients that contained phytase is accurate. We also measured the excretion of phosphorus from the pigs, and we can see that we reduced the excretions from 1.68 gram per day to 0.82 grams per day when we added phytase to the corn soybean meal diet. When we fed the corn soybean meal DDGS diet, Without phytase, we had phosphorus excretion of 1.43 grams per day. However, we were able to reduce this value to 0.82 grams per day when we added phytase to the diet. Now, it's important here to remember that we reduced dicalcium phosphate in the diet, and diet 4 that contained corn, soybean meal, and DDDS, and 500 units of phytase contained no dicalcium phosphate. And we'll see here that the performance of pigs 
and the retention of phosphorus is exactly the same or better than for the other pigs. That means that it is possible to feed pigs without any use of dicalcium phosphorus in the diet. To look further into the effects of phytase on the digestibility of phosphorus in corn co-products, we conducted a few more experiments. In this case, we added three different levels of phytase to a diet in which corn provided all the phosphorus. We had a diet without any phytase, we had a diet with 500 units of phytase, we had a diet with 1,000 units of phytase, and we had a diet with 1,500 units of phytase. And we will see here again that we increased the digestibility of phosphorus in corn quite significantly when we added 500 units of phytase to this diet. However, if we added more than 500 units of phytase to corn, we did not see a significant increase in phosphorus digestibility. So it appears from this that for corn, it is enough to add 500 units of phytase to the diet. We did the same thing for DDGS. However, as we've seen before, we did not see a significant increase in the digestibility of phosphorus in DDGS when we added phytase to this diet. And we see again that the digestibility even without phytase in DDGS is quite high, in this case about 76%, and this value is not significantly increased when we added phytase to DDGS. For high-protein DDG, we did see a small increase when we added 500 units of phytase to the diet, but no further increase when we added 1,000 or 500 units of phytase. And again, as we saw with DDGS, the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus in high-protein DDG, even without any phytase, is about 75%, which is much greater than in corn. And finally, we also added 500, 1,000, or 1,500 units of phytase to corn germ. And in this case, we saw a significant increase when we added phytase to the diet. And there's a linear effect of phytase here indicating that as we add more phytase, we get an increase in digestibility. The digestibility we observed in the diet without any phytase is very similar to the digestibility we observed for corn. And the digestibility the ability values we observed when we added phytase are also similar to the values for corn. However, all these values are less than the values we have observed when we use DDGS or high-protein DDG. Combined, these results indicate that when we use corn and corn germ and other ingredients that have not been fermented or used in ethanol production, we can get a significant increase by adding 500 units of phytase to these ingredients. However, addition of more than 500 units of phytase does not seem to increase the digestibility nearly as much. On the other hand, when we use high protein DDG or DDGS, we do not see an effect of adding phytase to these diets. I hope you have learned a few things about using standardized total tract digestibility values in formulation of diets for swine. We do believe that. Diets are most accurately formulated if we use these values, and as we have seen in some of the research we have conducted, it is possible to formulate diets even to weaning pigs without the use of any dicalcium phosphate, and we can reduce excretion of phosphorus quite dramatically by using this formulation technique. We have also seen that it is probably enough to use 500 units of phytase, and there does not seem to be a universal improvement in digestibility if we use greater level of phytase. However, the use of phytase in combination with distillers, dried grains with solubles, or other fermented feed ingredients will increase the digestibility of phosphorus quite dramatically in diets fed to pigs. With that, I want to thank you for your attention, but I do want to point out that you can visit our website and learn more about standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus or many other issues in swine nutrition. Our website is found at nutrition.ansi.illinois.edu.